Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this special and timely conversation. I'm Jason Marzak, Director of the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arst Latin America Center. For all those tuning in today from Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua, I'd like to say Feliz Bicentenario, Happy Independence Day. And while we aren't offering a celebratory drink virtually today, you can at least join the festivities using the hashtag Central America at 200. On behalf of the Adrian Arts Latin America Center, it's wonderful to be joined today by Ricardo Zuniga, who as of this morning is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Department of State's Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs. Great to have you here with us today, Ricardo. It's also my pleasure to welcome the Costa Rican Ambassador to the United States, Fernando Yorca, and as well, the Guatemalan Ambassador to the United States, Alfonso Quinones. Ambassadors, thank you so much for taking the time. Unfortunately, Salvadoran Ambassador Milena Mayorga had a last minute conflict. And while she can't join us today, we look forward to another opportunity to have her join us. September 15th marks the, both the beginning of Hispanic Heritage Month here in the United States, a time to recognize and applaud Latinos' many, many contributions to this country, and also marks the 200th anniversary of Central American independence from Spain. And while this year's independence celebrations are happening alongside many challenges that are often covered with respect to the region, there is also lots of reason to be hopeful about a more positive trajectory for the citizens of Central America. Today, we celebrate. We celebrate the region's potential. We celebrate its immense cultural contributions to the world, the richness of the region's history, and above all, the strength and resilience of its people. We are celebrating 200 years of independence but don't worry, we won't be going through 200 years of history today. As well, this is a moment to recognize what brings Central American countries together and how unity in the face of adversity can open additional pathways for a democratic, inclusive, and prosperous region. Alongside the renewed cooperation from the United States, that can have a transformative impact in improving the lives of Central American citizens. Today's virtual celebration of Central America's Bicentennial offers an opportunity to explore how to accelerate regional integration and foster multi-sectoral and international cooperation to build a more prosperous Central America. With that, I'd like to welcome and introduce our keynote speaker, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Ricardo Zuniga. Pete S. Zuniga is a career member of the U.S. Foreign Service who was named Special Envoy for the Northern Triangle this past March. He dual-headed as both Acting Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs before the confirmation of Brian, Ambassador Brian Nichols uh, just two days ago as Assistant Secretary. His previous assignments include Consular Service, service at the, as a, the U.S. Consul in Sao Paulo and also as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for the Western Hemisphere at the National Security Council. Pete Asaniga's leadership at the State Department and beyond, as I've seen firsthand, is already resulting in new ways in which the U.S. government can partner with the region and advancing a more prosperous future for Central Americans. With that, Ricardo, great to have you join us again, and the floor is yours for opening comments. Thank you very much, Jason. And uh, first of all, Feliz Bicentenario for my uh, colleagues. I, I was just recalling as the show was starting, one of my very first memories is sitting in Tegucigalpa watching the Honduran Air Force prepare for the September 15 celebration. Uh, and that's still cemented as, as something that an image that I recall uh, you know, 50, almost 50 years later. So uh, thank you very much for the chance to speak and to be here today. Uh, this bicentenario of five out of the seven Central American countries uh, is really an important date. And of course, for me personally, it was a date that, that was very important to me growing up. Uh, in our work as diplomats and the, as U.S. diplomats, it really is uh, work that's dominated by the challenges that we face. And I, my colleagues uh, who are on uh, as well uh, are aware. We are, our job is to, of course, focus on the, the problems and try to resolve them so that we can uh, make the best use of that potential that exists. We completely agree that this is a matter uh, where uh, the potential that exists within this community is something that is vital, not just to the region, but to the United States as well. And in fact, the United States has never been more closely linked to Central America than it is today. We have not only millions of Central Americans who call the United States home, we also have, uh, frankly, the, uh, the influence and importance of those same communities back in their home countries. So the United States, in many ways, is brought back to Central America through the presence of these uh, large and dynamic immigrant communities. 
they have absolutely enriched American life with their energy and determination. We see that every day. Apart from that, CAF to DR countries represent the third largest market for the United States and the Americas after Mexico and Brazil. And you can see, I mean, that's an, an enormous scale. Uh, when you compare uh, those very sizable economies, you see what the potential is. And frankly, in a region that we see today going through uh, serious difficulties for a, a wide variety of, region, of reasons, but certainly many related to the pandemic and to uh, other economic and social factors, uh, with that in mind, they are still a very sizable contributor to the U.S. economy as well. We're also, and this is very important, shared, uh, bound by shared values uh, and a shared vision for what the future of the world should look like. And nothing can be, nothing can bring societies more closely together than a shared vision for the world that they want their children to inherit. That is what true partnership is really about. Now, we know that democracy is fragile uh, and constantly uh, faces uh, obstacles to reaching the full uh, citizenry. We in the United States have seen with our own eyes and our own country uh, that we must always strive to do better and to build more inclusive uh, governance and defend our democratic institutions and protect the rights of individuals, in particular the most vulnerable in our societies. We also know that when things go wrong in Central America or when things go wrong in the United States, each side affects the other. Uh, that is why in the middle of a surge in irregular migration, we've been alarmed by and focused on uh, signs of democratic backsliding, but also have focused very much on what we need to do to create opportunities in Central America. Now, we need to look no further than the situation in Nicaragua to understand the democratic crises inevitably lead to social and economic disaster. Nicaragua is a testament to the myth that authoritarian governments or, in, uh, or weak governance can deliver stability and prosperity in the, in the Americas. It's not just Nicaragua. Looking at the current state of the region, we assess that rule of law is absolutely under a greater uh, level of threat than was the case uh, several years ago. And in particular, what we see is systematic efforts to undermine rule of law, demonstrate that certain actors in the region are intent on shielding themselves from accountability. Uh, of course, that part of that is a concern with threats to judicial independence in El Salvador and Guatemala. Um, these developments are often portrayed in the media as somehow a response or a reaction to the United States, but it really has to do uh, with uh, internal factors and it has to do with uh, kind of a competition of different parties, but really a competition where you have actors who are trying to shield themselves from accountability. Uh, that's a direct and immediate risk for the United States because we see that corruption, authoritarianism, and impunity are absolutely clear drivers of mass migration. Lack of judicial independence uh, enables corruption and arbitrary rule and discourages investment and reduces opportunity and security in Central America. That's why the Biden administration has prioritized strengthening democratic institutions and good governance at home and abroad. The United States will partner with governments, with civil society, and with others across the region, left, right, and center, to work toward commitments that our countries made 20 years ago when we adopted the Inter-American Democratic Charter. This is not about nation building, not about replacing the role of, uh, of uh, actors in Central America, nor is it about exporting values that are alien to Central America. On the contrary, what we're trying to do is support what Central American citizens expect and where governments have asked to collaborate with us, which is uh, in ensuring that elected officials are accountable, that um, they are ensuring free and fair elections, that they don't use their power to punish critics, and that all of us continue to work to improve the lives of people in our countries in real and concrete ways. So this administration has two overriding objectives in Central America in the coming months. The first is to reinforce democratic governance. And the second is to generate opportunities so people can build successful lives at home. We recognize our limitations. Our foreign assistance and diplomacy are not going to preserve institutions or create jobs on their own. We have to use our leverage strategically by helping clear the way for other actors who are working to improve conditions. And we have to work through differences. When those differences emerge, we have to continue to focus on our common objective of building the enabling conditions for growth in Central America. That's a line that I borrowed and stole actually from Ambassador Quinones that I have used 
uh, throughout my time working on Central America over the last few months because that's exactly what we're trying to do uh, and what we're trying to do uh, working together with our partners. Just create conditions where people can feel safe, prosperous, and secure uh, at home and feel that they are, have governments that are accountable to their needs. For example, in uh, uh, among other things, we're going to build on the vice president's call to action to unite hundreds of companies in committing in Central America and investing there if the conditions are in place for such investments and where there are barriers, working together to remove uh, or overcome those barriers. When companies work together on issues like digital inclusion or helping people uh, move from the informal sector to the formal sector, that work can have a, a, an important multiplying effect. We're working with the private sector on events uh, in, in an event in October to talk about the initial work that's been done and to rally companies to join our efforts to create the conditions uh, for investment in Central America. On the governance front, we're going to continue to work with governments and civil society uh, to help overcome uh, resistance to uh, accountability and reform. The anti-corruption task force announced by the vice president uh, in Guatemala uh, will help governments improve internal oversight and also help build cases in cooperation with committed public servants there. We see a growing connection, unfortunately, between organized crime and political actors, especially uh, through the role of campaign finance at both the national and municipal level. That's a concern that warrants special attention and one where the United States may be able to help. Beyond issues of governance, we face shared challenges that can't be managed by just one country, ranging from COVID-19 and the climate crisis to managing migration collaboratively and countering organized crime. We've seen time and again that developments in one country affect us all. International cooperation is absolutely essential and a core uh, approach of this administration. I'm delighted to be here today to commemorate this bicentennial with you. And I wanna quote Vice President Harris, who said just a few months ago, our administration firmly believes in the potential of the region and the power of the people of the region. Latin Americans are shaping their own future, are writing their own story, you hold the pen. I look forward to answering your questions and to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Ricardo. I think your um, your personal commitment to the region is evidenced by those comments, as well as uh, how many trips now to to the region and, and the, uh, just in twenty twenty one. Well, I lost track, but I think I was at six in the in Central America and, and Mexico, and uh, uh, another couple for other parts of the region. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a very very busy agenda. I, I want to invite everybody who's joining uh, to feel free to submit questions using the Q and A function if you're watching via Zoom, and we'll try to pull in those questions as part of this conversation or toward the end. I'd like to start off, uh, Ricardo. You were um, uh, mentioning, of course, the, the incredible commitment of, of of this administration to Central America and uh, and to giving people, as you mentioned, the vice president, giving people hope, uh, additional hope in their in their countries. I want to start by looking at today's bicentennial in the context of what's playing out and also the U.S. commitment. Um, about six weeks ago, uh, the administration released the strategy for addressing the root causes of migration in Central America. Um, this is a great opportunity to first begin with an update on the strategy's implementation and also what you've seen insofar as the receptivity to the strategy uh, in the region. Well, first of all, we see enormous receptivity to the strategy. What we hear time and again uh, is that the strategy reflects the actual needs uh, if, of people of different actors in the region. And, and that we hope that's the case because we developed the strategy through a, a very consultative process that was intended to reflect what uh, a range of actors, not just one group, but a range of actors believed were the most serious challenges uh, in the region. We find a, an enormous receptivity to um, the pillars that were established, including ones that may not have gotten as much attention in the past, for example, the focus on gender-based violence, which we believe is not just one factor. It's, it's, it's a strategic element, a place where government, civil society, and the private sector can invest together uh, to make real changes for people on a, unfortunately, a phenomenon that we believe is a, is a big factor in social instability in Central America. So what we see is good receptivity. Now we need to move into the implementation phase, working with our partners. Ricardo, the, the marking 200 years today, this is an opportunity to look at, uh, as you've laid out in your opening comments, the many, of course, the many, cha the many challenges at, uh, across the region, but also, you know, the many opportunities and the opportunity for hope and the opportunity for, uh, for an even better future uh, uh, for, the, for the region uh, writ large. 
from your perspective, what, what, what do you see as the significance of this bicentennial? What does this bicentennial mean for the future trajectory of the region, um, uh, being somebody who's originally from the region yourself? So I think what's really important is, number one, as I said, we focus often on the challenges, but we overlook the fact that uh, we're, you know, this is what we're seeing now is that we have societies that have expectations, that have hopes, that have capacity that uh, needs to be met and needs to be realized. And I think what we're seeing in Central America is not that different from what we see in many parts of the world where those aspirations and expectations um, are difficult to realize because they are operating within economic and social and political structures that have hemmed in growth. What we see is a region of world-class artists, world-class um, entrepreneurs, peacemakers, athletes, and we see that in the United States. We are beneficiaries of all of that uh, as well. And it is true, of course, at the same time, that societies in Central America have struggled to overcome centuries-old uh, structural problems such as inequality and uh, uh, kind of fragmented uh, regional approaches that remain a feature today. So we're not trying, we, we are certainly not Pollyannish, but nor should we ignore the fact that we have this enormous potential. And these are not small countries anymore. These are just in Honduras, El Salvador, uh, and Guatemala, you're talking about 30 million people. And uh, this is a, a, a human potential, a capacity that we should think about in this ecosystem that runs from Colombia to Canada uh, as being firmly uh, a, a part of this. And uh, this North American uh, unit, this, this grouping that can operate much more effectively if we do so together and reduce barriers to trade to the, to the regular movement of people uh, that have labor flows that make sense. Uh, but also where we address these very serious governance concerns that continue to limit the ability to realize those, uh, um, the dreams that should match that potential that exists. Ricardo, uh, one um, question in the, in the, in the Q&A here uh, is about the role of Mexico. Uh, and I know this is something that, uh, that you and, and the administration have focused on, is the, the role of Mexico as a, as a partner. Uh, in the in the region, this is a, a question that uh, comes from uh, Rachel uh, Scalisi. Is opportunities that you see for Mexico to collaborate with the U.S. on uh, our efforts in the Northern Triangle? Uh, she specifically mentions anti-corruption and security, uh, but I, I would also mention um, economic development, uh, which of course is a, a priority for President Lopez Obrador in the South of Mexico, and obviously the connections with 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 Guatemala. Uh, so I'd like to ask you about that, then move yeah. on to the private sector and talk about Nicaragua as well. But let's start with that. Right. So I think that, okay, so first of all, I would say that uh, it's absolutely right. Mexico has been a key partner uh, since the beginning of this administration in, uh, in finding ways to kind of make the best and do get the best uh, social development outcomes that we possibly can. We have a, uh, a commitment to working between USAID and IMEXC, the Mexican Development Agency, with a focus on Central America. Uh, Mexico, of course, has programs of which they're very proud. that are conditional cash transfer programs that are involved in, um, uh, in developing people and in, in uh, environmental preservation, uh, conservation. So the uh, scope for collaboration is quite large. We have already sent one joint team to look at areas for cooperation between our development efforts. Uh, at the highest levels, we have committed to that, and we are looking for areas to work together. Of course, as you said, one area is in the official realm between our development agencies, but really the best and most effective way to uh, increase the power of the relationship between the United States and Mexico is increasing the ability of Central American countries to trade and to have stronger and more, uh, and, uh, more open commercial relationships with uh, the United States and Mexico working together. On the uh, on the subject of, of trade and commerce, um, recall throughout history, Central American countries have shared the deep cultural, uh, human, economic, and political ties that have allowed the region to often uh, work on common challenges, including economic de development. And here the private sector has been uh, a, uh, a very key driver of economic growth, of course, innovation for the region, 
at times working across countries and sectors. You mentioned the, the vice president's call to the private sector. You mentioned the, the meeting next month. I'd like to ask you about opportunities you see for the Central American private sector today to help advance economic opportunity, as well as address urgent climate, education, health challenges, and promote long-term investments. What do, you, what do you see as are some of those untapped opportunities uh, for the Central American private sector? And maybe adding on to that, there was a question in the, in the Q&A with regard to if there's a strategy uh, to uh, uh, help to ensure that U.S. private investment uh, from corporations uh, in the region is, um, is uh, how, to, how to further that type of investment and make sure that mm -hmm. it is protected in the future. So I think it's very important to point out that most investment in Central America is going to end up coming from Central America. So the, uh, it, the reality is that in some locations, the private sector have been, has been reluctant to make the investments because they have a concern about rule of law and whether those investments are going to be secure. So unfortunately, we've had many instances where... Uh, uh, the, where private sectors have chosen to invest outside of Central America, even though they want to develop their own communities. Uh, I think the most important thing that we can do between multinational companies, U.S. companies, multinational companies, and local actors is focus on the practical barriers to growth, whether those are involve improving the digitization of um, administrative procedures and improving uh, customs and port uh, facilities, working together to identify as uh, CEPAL has, for example, identify the major infrastructure investments that are needed, and they're working together to make sure that the right environment exists. Uh, Ambassador Quinones has heard me many times raise something that others have raised, which is the issue of ensuring that the public-private partnership law in Guatemala is uh, finalized and uh, it has the, the legal framework to enable much more domestic and foreign investment. This really is about creating the conditions using policy and using collaboration between private sectors, civil society, and not just not just the maybe who are thought of as the largest private sector actors, but focusing as well on SMEs, focusing on those who are in the informal sector and finding ways to include them through banking services, again, through digital commerce, uh, but in large and small ways, finding ways to stimulate that growth because so much of the labor force is still in the vulnerable informal sector. Finding practical solutions to these are an area where we should be able to work together between us, the private sector, civil society, governments, and banks. And uh, Ricardo, moving, continuing on the subject of, of commerce, investment, and frankly, opportunity, uh, before uh, a follow following question at the end here on, on Nicaragua, I'd like to ask one of the uh, results of the pandemic is we've seen these shifts in trade and global supply chains, uh, nearshoring and, and these and demographic trends that really, if leveraged early and correctly, correctly, could help Central America really get even closer to regional integration and could provide new opportunities for commerce with the United States. What is, what's your view on this unique potential for the region and how can the U.S. partner with countries to help propel the economic integration and advance this concept of, of near shoring, or some have said as well, uh, ally shoring uh, close to our shores. Right, so there are, uh, there's a lot of discussion about this, friend shoring, ally shoring, near shoring. None of this happens without a deliberate effort and a recognition that what we're talking about today is political economy, not just free trade, but what the impact is of that trade and how to ensure that it's, for example, in the case of the United States, supporting our strategic objective to have secure supply chains. So uh, there's obviously potential. We've heard from uh, many companies, from the textile sector to the technology sector to service sector about their desire and agriculture, certainly. Uh, their strong interest in seeing uh, a, a deliberate effort to uh, include Central America as part of this, uh, of this effort. The, the uh, Biden administration is also very focused on uh, improving the role of the DFC as an as a uh, vehicle for um, developing um, incentives for this kind of investment, and we believe that as we focus on this Build Back Better World campaign uh, of the administration, that we are going to start seeing uh, new opportunities. But we have to do this in consultation with our partners in the region. Again, trying to be as specific and practical as we can about 
whether there are legal and administrative changes that might make all of this possible, and always working with Congress. We've seen enormous interest on the part of the U.S. Congress in finding ways to make uh, our existing tools work more effectively, and on a bipartisan basis, uh, interest in making our tools work more effectively and uh, developing new tools if that's what we need to encourage growth in Central America where we see an enormous strategic uh, imperative. Thank you. I know we could probably spend the next couple of hours uh, having this conversation, uh, but I, I know that time doesn't allow for that. Uh, I want to ask one important last question because we'd be remiss to not mention the longstanding um, structural challenges for strengthening democratic institutions and governance in the region, uh, most notably corruption and rule of law, and notably the, what is happening in, in Nicaragua right now uh, and the threats to democratic stability and human rights that that, that poses uh, uh, for uh, both the Nicaraguan people and, and more broadly. How is the United States uh, would, helping to address the situation in Nicaragua and how can Nicaragua's neighbors also come together to show democratic unity uh, in the face of, of what is happening uh, in Nicaragua currently? So I think, you know, I was saying to someone earlier today that in today's Nicaragua, I think Augusto Sandino would be arrested by Ortega and Murillo. It really is a, unfortunately, what we're seeing is that this is a effort to rapidly dismantle democratic culture in Nicaragua. This is not just a matter of implementation of laws that were themselves passed through irregular means. It really is an effort to turn Nicaragua away from decades, even in the most difficult periods, they still, Nicaragua was still nested within the inter-American system. This is a rejection of the founding documents of the inter-American system. What we're seeing today, unfortunately, means that there can be no reasonable expectation of an electoral process that's free and fair or uh, elections that can have any credibility. They, the Ortega Murillo are using Russian-inspired legislation to justify repression. And uh, again, these are uh, laws that run contrary to the founding documents of the inter-American system. But we urge our Central American neighbors and partners in the region to kind of keep talking about this issue in multilateral fora, send a clear signal that these are repressive actions that are not going to be tolerated. Uh, I think, again, the, the situation in Nicaragua gives a lie to the notion that authoritarian or authoritarian leaning uh, governments can somehow provide increased security and prosperity. On the contrary, the tens of thousands of Nicaraguans who've moved out just in recent months are a demonstration of where this ultimately leads and the reason why we have put dedicated so much time to questions of governance uh, and democracy. Uh, we're also, and just to close here, we're also very concerned that other countries may seek to um, take a successful autocratic model in Nicaragua uh, and borrow from it whether it's through limitations on the work of NGOs uh, or by trying to establish relationships where the private sector is urged to look the other way on questions of governance in exchange for having access to particular resources. In other words, just have, uh, uh, you know, a, a, the kind of kleptocracy that pretty clearly uh, President Ortega and Rosario Murillo would like to establish in Nicaragua. Ricardo, I want to end on a message of, of, of hope and as we as we celebrate 200 years of Central American independence, what, what is that last message of, of, of yours you'd like to share with this uh, this community today of, of what you see in so far as your hope for Central America looking forward? So for me, the most important and telling uh, sign of what the potential is in Central America is what Central Americans achieve in the United States. We have uh, again, uh, enormous contributions. We have some of the leading entrepreneurs in the United States come from Central America. We have people who have changed sectors who come from Central America. We have uh, people who send billions of dollars back every year to Central America. What we want and what we hope to see and what we believe is entirely possible because we've seen success in the region. Here's the other thing is that while we talk about these challenges, over the decades, we've also seen improved social conditions. We've also seen a reduced inequality, uh, notably in the case of El Salvador over decades, one of the most unequal countries in, in Central America, at least by the Gini uh, coefficient, became increasingly equal. A lot of that did not have to do with necessarily uh, increases in production and access in Central America, but El Salvador is part of this globalized economy. We believe that uh, in the, under the right conditions and under the right governance conditions, the ability of Central Americans to thrive is really unlimited. We see that uh, we are only going to increase our, our commitment as the United States 
to the well-being of Central America, but it is so intricately linked to the well-being of the United States. We not only, it's not a question of having a strategic choice. Uh, we, we don't have a strategic choice. We must ensure the success of Central America. But we also have a, a deep uh, social and family bond with Central America that, uh, where we realize that by helping our, our partners and our friends in Central America, we are helping ourselves. And, and we're doing that uh, out of goodwill as well as need. Uh, so whether it's on issues of the COVID vaccines, uh, on the uh, $4 billion over four years that this administration intends to uh, contribute to our uh, development efforts, those are important, but they are not as important as the activity and the commitment that we see from Central Americans themselves to uh, drive forward development, improve governance, democracy, uh, and just simply the well-being of their, of their fellow citizens. So our bet is a bet on Central America. Our bet is a bet on Central Americans who wish the best for their region. I, I couldn't agree with you more. The, the, the resilience, the efforts, the hope of the Central American people gives me so much enthusiasm for the future of the region. Uh, among them are, are the two wonderful ambassadors from Guatemala and Costa Rica who are who are joining us today for this next segment. So Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary um, Zuniga, thank you so much for coming on today's show and, and joining us in this uh, virtual celebration. And thanks for all your, your excellent work and, and comments. Very pleased to do it. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to now move to our conversation with Ambassador Quinones of Guatemala, Ambassador Yorca of Costa Rica. And with that, I will hand it over to Maria Fernanda Bosmoski the Deputy Director of Programs at the Adrian R. Slide America Center, as well as the lead for our work uh, in Central America. Maria Fernanda, over to you. Thanks, Jason. And thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Suniga, for your remarks today and for taking the time um, to offer your message. It is great to see your continued personal commitment and the commitment of the United States to Central America. Um, as a fellow Central American, Feliz Día de la Independencia to everyone who's joining us. Uh, we're very excited for this next panel and this next conversation. I'm excited to moderate with two highly respected and admired Central American ambassadors. I have with me Ambassador Alfonso Quinones, who is the ambassador of Guatemala to the United States. Um, ambassador Quinones, does not need any introductions, but I will say that he has previously occupied several positions at the Organization of the American States. He's a highly accomplished diplomat and is a lawyer by training. Uh, he's also a, a good ally and, and friend of the center, Ambassador Bienvenido. Also with me is Ambassador Fernando Yorca, Ambassador of the United, uh, Ambassador of Costa Rica to the United States. He is also a medical doctor by training um, and has over a decade of experience in international development, uh, mostly throughout Europe. Um, Ambassador Mahaur, bienvenido a esta conversación. As has been mentioned, the 200th anniversary of independence of Central American countries is happening at a moment of multiple crises including a very concerning humanitarian and political crisis in Nicaragua that is worse by the day, and a general sentiment of uncertainty, high levels of unemployment, and a climate and gender-based violence crisis that shows little signs of improving. But today is also a moment for us to reflect on the region's economic reactivation um, and a moment to look towards the future and to act to fully achieve the region's potential, particularly on the economic and commercial fronts. With that, let me bring in our two speakers, um, Ambassador Quinones and Ambassador Jorca. We just heard from Pida Suniga uh, on the significance of the bicentennial for the region from a US perspective. But I want to open up this conversation by asking you, what is the significance of the bicentennial for your respective countries? Ambassador Quinones. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maria Fernanda, and thank you to the Atlantic uh, Council for uh, opening this uh, opportunity for us. Uh, and, and obviously, thank you to Jason. Um, 
obviously, uh, September the 15th is a very special uh, occasion uh, as it marks the 200th anniversary of the Central American independence. Uh, the bicentennial of our independence is certainly a momentous occasion, but it's also a moment to pause and, as you were saying, is to reflect on our past. Uh, but doing it in order to learn from it and 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 be well prepared to build uh, uh, a better future, which actually that future starts today. Um, when I was preparing for uh, a speech that I have to give um, on the independence a, a few days ago, I, I, I looked at the book that I had, it's a quotationary, and, and I found this quote that says, independence is an achievement, it's not a bequest. And, 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 and that's important because it's something that has to be worked for. And, and, and that's where our founding fathers did uh, 200 years ago. At that moment, the independence meant separating from Spain, but not uh, for the sake of just separating, but because there was a conviction uh, that such action was going to be beneficial for the people of Central America. And that novel aspiration of wanting, wanting something um, uh, good, uh, uh, something better for, for the people still valid, still valid, and actually it's now more than ever uh, because of the challenges that we are facing as individual countries and also as the region, uh, particularly right now with, uh, with COVID. Uh, but as you were saying, it's also an opportunity. Uh, it's the ideal moment to relaunch regional integration and an and integration where, where we have to see ourselves uh, united because united we are stronger. Uh, I, I remember having seen many years ago a, a cartoon drawing uh, where, where there was a, uh, there were two 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 pictures. The, the first one was a, a number of of of, of gentlemen, uh, tall gentlemen, uh, talking among each other, and there were other five small gentlemen that wanted to talk to the tall guy, guys. And, and they were not being uh, uh, um, taken into consideration because they were small. In the next drawing, all these five little men were one on top of the other, and they were at the same level as the as, as the as, as the other men. So, so I think that that's that that puts in a very graphic way how important it is to have a united uh, Central America, which, by the way, uh, that integration has proven to be very beneficial for the Central American countries, particularly in economic terms. Uh, for Guatemala, uh, uh, it happens to be the second trading partner, uh, and also since the integration started in the 50s and, and the Central American Common Market was launched, Guatemala has grown steadily. Uh, between the 50s and the 80s, before the last decade, Guatemala grew at a steady 3%. 30 years of consistent growth uh, since the signing of the char charter that created the Organization of Central American States in 1951. We all know that consistent growth is the key uh, to, uh, uh, to raise the GDP of the countries and also the GDP per capita, which I personally think that it's a better measure to, uh, to really see how the progress, uh, how, how, how people are, 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 are progressing in, 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 uh, in a country. Currently, uh, the, the, the uh, per capita GDP in Guatemala is about 8,000 a year. But you know, and, and, and a friend of mine gave me these figures, and, and I think it's, it's important to bring them up. It says, to get, uh, for instance, to the level of the GDP per capita uh, that Mexico has growing at 3% would take us 29 years. Or to get to Colombia's level, it would take us 20 years. And if we're ambitious and want to get to the level of, uh, let's say, Norway or the US, it would take us 70 years if we keep growing at 3%. Therefore, we really need to grow at a higher rate. And there, a dynamic Central American market is essential. And also the trade and investment relationship uh, with our largest trading partner, which is the US. So uh, we can use the bicentennial celebrations to launch or relaunch the relationship, not only amongst the Central American countries, but also uh, with our international willing partners. Thank you, Ambassador. I loved what you said about independence being something that we work on. We work for every day and we work on it. And, and your message about a, a dynamic Central America and how that can help achieve common goals for prosperity as well. Ambassador Jorka, I also want to give you an opportunity to, to lay out um, the significance of this bicentennial for Costa Rica. 
Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Fernanda. It's, of course, it's a very special occasion. And I want to thank the, the Atlantic Council and also Adrian and Jason, the opportunity to share this panel with my friend, Ambassador Quinones. And of course, with a special in the uh, Ricardo Zuniga, and 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 well, to 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 recognize uh, as Costa Rican as a Costa Rican ambassador that we celebrate our history, uh, uh, developing our democracy, the way we develop a strong uh, um, education system and also a healthcare system. And at the same time, how we we were able to to avoid army a long time ago, and 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 at the same time, uh, how we we were able to put that money in trying to invest in, in in people, and and that is something that that actually nowadays it's it's something that we need all all around the world, and we recognize that to develop an effective democracy that uh, develops to, to, to the people what, what actually they need. And at the same time, I do agree with, with uh, especially me, Ricardo, that uh, the region is not a small region at all. And I do agree with Ambassador Quinones that, that this is an opportunity to recognize the way we, we are all linked together, not only after 200 years of independence life, uh, uh, recognizing our that, that we share the same origin, but at the same time to recognize that we, we actually share the same future all together. And that is very, very, very important for us. And it's a strong message. Um, we celebrate the, the way the, the United States it's, it's actually, as, as you mentioned, Maria Fernanda, um, uh, recognizing Central American region and as, as one of the most important regions, not only because it's very close to the United States, but, and, and it's a, a very special uh, partner in, in political and trade uh, uh, affairs, but at the same time, because uh, the United States recognized that a lot of people uh, migrants are coming from the region and are coming through the region and and the way they develop this migration strategy is is, is taking into the account the whole region as 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 one region that should bring uh uh possible solutions uh to 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 all to to the to the problems we are all facing together uh, during this pandemic, we have to recognize that what happened in one country is going to affect the rest of the countries and not only the neighbors, all of us. And, and at the same time, we have to recognize that climate change is a, is a real thing in the region, it's a real thing in the world. And, and more often we are dealing with uh, natural disasters also in the region. And, 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 and we also recognize we have uh, huge challenges uh, fighting against corruption and trafficking. When I'm, I'm saying trafficking, not only I'm not talking about only drug trafficking, also human trafficking. And at the same time, we also recognize as a Costa Rican, but it's also present in the, re in the rest of the region and, and an employment problem we, 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 we have to deal with. And, 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 and we see a lot of opportunities like, like uh, the special enemy, Ricardo Suniga already mentioned, uh, working together with the United States uh, on, on, on DFC, but at the same time on, on, on the CAFTA DR agreement we, we have and, 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 and we defend. Um, of course, we have to improve the performance of our institutions, but at the same time, um, we have a lot of opportunities on, on, on near sharing mainly and, and in some other. Again, working all together and working with the United States as a great partner. Thank you, Ambassador. And I'd, I'd like to take that last part of the opportunities, especially on the commercial and economic front that you were also mentioning, Ambassador Quinones. Um, right now, 
Guatemala is the president pro tempore of the SICA. We also have at the regional level the SIECA, the uh, Central American Secretariat for Economic Integration. And you were talking about um, just the, the opportunities and the potential that exists for the region to come together and, and seize those opportunities to get to the next level. Uh, otherwise, it's going to take years for, for the individual countries um, as you were saying, with this visual image of the countries getting to, uh, one on top of each other to, to get to the tall man. But I would like to ask you, Ambassador Quinones, what is some low hanging fruit for Guatemala to maximize those mechanisms and those four that already exist uh, to, on the one hand, strengthen regional cooperation, but on the other, but specifically economic regional cooperation? Thank you, Maria Fernanda, for bringing up the fact that Guatemala this semester has the pro -temporary presidency of the Central American integration system. And, and you know, it, it is interesting that this semester is, is not just important because we are celebrating the bicentennial, but uh, we are also commemorating the 70th anniversary of the signing of the Charter of the Organization of Central American States. Uh, and that took place in December of 1951. And also is the 30th anniversary of the signing of the Tegucigalpa Treaty, which was signed in December of 1991, which created the Central American integration system. As you can see, the integration ideal in Central America is not new. Uh, there were even some uh, wars uh, in, in, in the process of, of, of trying to keep us uh, together. But, but you know, um, it has, has, it has had its ups and downs, uh, and I think uh, 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 that happens in any integration system. Uh, I mean, let's just look at uh, Brexit, for example, in, in, in Europe. Uh, in the case of Central America, we're still together, uh, notwithstanding the differences that uh, may exist uh, among the countries. And actually, uh, we have been adding members uh, since SICA was, was created. Uh, originally, we were five, and now we are eight. Um, you know, um, from my years at the OAS, uh, I remember very well a phrase that was uh, said by the first Secretary General of the OAS uh, in 1948, uh, Mr. Lleras Camargo. And it was about the OAS, the organization. It says uh, that uh, actually, uh, and that phrase can also be applied to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, CIECA and SICA. And, and it says that uh, the OAS would be no more and no less of what the mentioned. So, at the end of the day, the burden is more on the member uh, members than on, on the institutions. So uh, having that in mind, um, Guatemala, as the, 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 the uh, pro tempore chair of, of the Central American integration system, put forward uh, uh, five priorities uh, on for, for this six months that we have the presidency. And the first one, uh, is precisely relaunching uh, the integration process, focusing on the political dialogue, institutional strengthening, and also envisioning the integration of the future, which I think it's very important because all the things going on uh, in Central America and in the world. The other four, four priorities are economic reactivation, promoting trade and investment, uh, promoting trade, investment, and tourism and enhance the regional capacities to address the current and future sanitary crisis, obviously having COVID very much at the forefront of, 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 of the uh, concerns that we have right now. Uh, the, third, uh, the, uh, the fourth one is strengthening the capacity to achieve nutritional and, and, food, and food security. And the fifth one uh, is something that Ambassador York has mentioned, which is very important, which is addressing climate change and increasing the resiliency to natural disasters. Unfortunately, the region is prone to natural disasters, as we witnessed last year uh, with the storms uh, Eta and, and, and Iota. And, and the question is, and I have said it many times, the question is not if we are going to have a natural disaster, but when are we having? Uh, when are we going to have a natural disaster? And therefore, uh, we have to work on creating that resiliency. So those issues are uh, are not going to be uh, resolved in seven months, in six months, which is our presidency. But COVID permitting, uh, the dialogue would be there to further those objectives, uh, and 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 we're hoping that that would have results and we would end up with a system that it's more robust than the one that we have right now. 
Thank you, Ambassador uh, Quinones and Ambassador Jorca. Actually, Costa Rica had the presidency before before Guatemala. Um, and Ambassador Quinones was just talking about that third pillar of promoting trade and investment, which I know is a big issue for a big priority, better said, for Costa Rica. Um, Jason mentioned it as well in his conversation with the PDAS about the, the shifts in global supply chains, nearshoring. Even at the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center, we are big proponents that we are in need of a regional export strategy that could result in a better aligned supply chains and that takes advantage of the country's comparative advantage and better positions Central America as a competitive and attractive region. Can you talk about the Costa Rican experience on the one hand, but also the role of the private sector and allies like the United States in helping to propel Central American trade, which um, if I'm not mistaken, is very low comparatively? Yes, well, definitely. Um... We, we, we need to bring more and better jobs to the region. And we have a lot of opportunities to do so working with the United States. And, and there, there are definitely lots of nearshoring opportunities. And, and we have a couple of tools that we should take advantage from. Definitely, uh, we have a great agreement, the CAFTA DR. Uh, it it's, has a lot of 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 uh advantages uh it's a it's a strong trade platform strong protection of intellectual property rights strong protection of environment and commitment to high uh, international standards uh actually makes us work together with the government of the united states and at the same time uh, we, we, we have some geographic um, uh, advantages, the proximity with the United States, the same time zone, and, and of course, the cultural, the cultural way of living that we share with our partners. And, 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 but, but at the same time, we recognize that we should improve that trade in some specific areas. We are talking about some some security uh, is special areas. If we talk about uh, to include a chapter that takes into account all the e-commerce, for example, cyber security is something that we should uh, uh, take into account, definitely. And another thing is that we recognize that we should improve the, the infrastructure uh, uh, limitations we still have in the region that, that that means connectivity, uh, road ports, and airports, and and but it's 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 actually an opportunity we have, and at the same time, um, well, we we should recover forest, for example, talking about a green economy as a as a great regional opportunity we we have. And, and just just to let you know that Costa Rica wants to share all the experience we have in those areas. Uh, Costa Rica has been uh, successful bringing uh, foreign direct investors to the country. And, and of course, uh, we are actually sharing this experience, working together with the World Bank and, and, and also with the IDB uh, very special actors that that are actually helping us and we are sure are going to impact the whole region. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador Quinones, back to you. A uh, quick, very short question. Do you think it's time to modernize CAFTA? <laughs> All depends, um, because it is important to dynamize uh, uh, any free trade agreement. So it's more beneficial to, uh, to the countries that are party to those agreements. But it's important to see the scope uh, and, and the objective of, of, of renegotiating the, the, the agreements. If, if the, the outcome of that process is, is, is beneficial to making more dynamic the, the trade between the countries, uh, so be it. And, and I think that, that here is something uh, uh, important, which I have said many, many times, which uh, is, is, is a phrase that, that you may have heard. It says, 
we rather have more trade on aid, more open markets, more opportunities for our products. Increasing trade and investment is really the sustainable way of becoming more prosperous. And by being so, well, more, more stable and, and less migration will take place. And there, the private sector plays a key role. And, and you know, let me rephrase that. The private sector plays the key role. And they are, uh, they are the, the ones best positioned to create in a sustainable way the opportunities that are needed. So, 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 so we have to work hard uh, and, and, and hand in hand with the private sector to be able to maintain the growth uh, that we need to become more prosperous. Thank you, Ambassador Jorka. I'm actually also curious to hear your thoughts on, on that question of modernizing CAFTA. I'm not suggesting we reopen everything. I'm just asking, should we modernize it? Yes, no, I already actually went through in some, some way. We need, we have a great agreement, but we need to, to introduce uh, uh, the, concept, the concept of e-commerce and uh, linked to that, cybersecurity affairs are, are, are there. But, but we also have the opportunity to, and I do agree with Ambassador Quinones, we should um, take the opportunity to um, guarantee that the population are going to have access to more and better employment there in rural areas where we actually need them uh, so we, we we will try to to make them stop fleeing the region uh, trying to to look a better future and 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 and, and recognizes recognizing that we are able to provide that better future in, in our own countries definitely Ambassador Quinones, we have two minutes in 30 seconds. What is your, your parting message for, for everyone who's tuning in? Um, and by the way, I, I would like to say that this recording will be available across our platforms. Both conversations um, will be available for, for viewing after, after this event is over. Uh, thank you very much, Maria Fernanda. And, and in closing, I, I think my message would be that, that we want to see the relationship between uh, the Central American countries and the United States, uh, uh, one as, uh, of, of partners. Uh, we are an important region for the, for the United States. It is key for the United States that we are a prosperous region that, and, and, and that we um, are, are, are better equipped to address uh, the, the challenges that we have. Um, and, and you know, we also want to see the United States uh, uh, as, as partners being uh, contribute to uh, reaching our mutual objectives. Um, as as, as, as um, uh, Ricardo Zuniga mentioned, the government of the United States has rolled out a series of strategies, which also are position, policy papers, policy positions, aimed at implementing some actions to promote opportunities, but also to address some of the issues that prevent reaching those objectives that uh, mutual objectives that we have. And, you know, reading um, uh, 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 some of these documents and obviously regarding this approach, there is one thing that I think is very important. And, and I mentioned this in a colloquium that I participated a few weeks ago. Uh, the title of that one was A New Agenda for the Hemisphere. And what I said was that uh, that agenda in order to be effective, must not be for the hemisphere, but with the hemisphere. Mm -hmm. and, and that has to be as a result of a dialogue. And, and, and that is valid for, for the case of Central America. That agenda would be not for Central America, but with Central America. Mm -hmm. And the strategies should be not for Central America, but with Central America. And I think that in that way, where there is a buying in by all the countries, uh, uh, Central America and the United States, we would be able to achieve the mutual objectives that we have. Thank you, Ambassador Quinones. Ambassador Jorka, closing comments? Definitely, we have a huge opportunity of, of working together uh, all Central American countries with the United States. And, and, and we already know that the United States also wants to bring uh, Mexico as, uh, to the table. And that is something that, that we see as a great opportunity. Uh, um, 
as, as Ambassador Quinones already, already mentioned, if the results are going to be the best for all of us, definitely. Thank you, Ambassador. We have run out of time. Thank you, everyone who has joined us. Um, and please be on the lookout for, for our events in Central America. Thank you.